Hello, my name is Emily Mackel. I'm a professor of ancient Greek history in the history department at the University of California, Berkeley. I was asked to put together a few words for you today about the environment in the ancient Mediterranean world with the hope that it will assist you with your teaching of the sixth grade ancient history curriculum this year. The first thing that I would like you to understand is that the Mediterranean upon which Greece, Egypt, Rome, Israel, the Levant are all situated. This sea sits at the intersection of the European, Asian, and African continents where tectonic plates overlap. And the result is a, uh, an incredibly fragmented region. I hope this map uh, gives you a sense. Um, this is a very dramatically uh, uh, fragmented region uh, with desert, mountains, and a heavily indented coastline, really uh, all the way from, uh, from the west end of the Mediterranean to the east. Uh, it is also, this Mediterranean Sea is also a very uh, deep and almost fully enclosed sea. The only opening is here at the western end uh, where the Straits of Gibraltar open uh, just slightly uh, into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, otherwise, it's fully enclosed and this means that there are uh, only very small tidal changes um, uh, and uh, a relatively uh, settled uh, maritime experience. The fragmented coastline and uh, the mountains all around also mean uh, that one can sail on this sea and not lose sight of land in, uh, from pretty much from, uh, from west to east or from east to west. This is a rather unusual map that shows uh, in the shaded, the shaded regions show uh, areas where uh, if you are sailing in them, you will lose sight of land. In other words, you can sail through all the white areas and always be able to see land. Uh, and one outcome of this basic fact is that ancient mariners did in fact uh, stop regularly. They took the long coastal routes rather than the short uh, 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 open sea routes so that they could remain in sight of land, so that they could stop regularly. Uh, and this meant um, a very, very high degree of uh, interaction uh, as traders and travelers moved around this world by sea. Uh, the intersection of those tectonic plates created this deep, almost enclosed sea, and it also created the mountains, the highly indented coastline, and uh, with those things, the very high degree of intervisibility between places. So in this landscape, there are two fundamental features. The first is fragmentation. And I've already talked a little bit about the physical fragmentation. Um, uh, of the landscape, but there is, there is also a fragmentation of resources that's very, very important for understanding the environmental uh, condition of the ancient Mediterranean. Um, this is a world uh, in which uh, resources were highly uh, localized and highly specialized uh, so that um, one community might have plenty of one thing but a dearth of another and their neighbors might have plenty of another thing and a dearth of yet a third thing. Um, the third way in which fragmentation manifested itself is in habitation. This is a world of thousands and thousands of uh, independent and interdependent communities. Uh, the emphasis in the ancient sources on, uh, on the independence of each of these communities is, is somewhat of an exaggeration. Um, for ideological purposes, everyone wanted to be, uh, to be totally independent. In fact, they were, uh, they were interdependent in uh, some very interesting ways. And that brings us to the second main fundamental feature of connectivity. So in this highly fragmented world, people were very, very highly connected by maritime uh, as well as overland transportation for purposes of trade, 
for religion, for war, and for diplomacy. So if you can think about those two phenomena of fragmentation and connectivity going hand in hand with one another um, through as, as you move uh, with your students throughout the, the study of the ancient world, I think that will be very, very helpful in terms of thinking about how their own, how they organize their own society uh, in response to the environmental conditions in which they found themselves. The constraints were very significant. Uh, this is a world uh, that uh, got by on rain-fed agriculture with the exception of riverine systems in Mesopotamia and Egypt. This meant uh, uh, the, the Mediterranean climate gives them wet winters and dry summers, not too unlike California in uh, some parts anyway of the Mediterranean. Um, uh, but the, the, the lack of large-scale irrigation uh, meant that they had to uh, shift all their activities to uh, capture the benefits of the rain when it came uh, and not have crops in the ground uh, during those extremely dry and hot summers. Uh, timber supplies are also limited in this world, partly because of the low levels of rainfall. Um, uh, Timber that was good for construction and for shipbuilding was pretty restricted to the mountainous regions uh, to the north and uh, was quite expensive. There are a few, few exceptions, a few more uh, southerly um, uh, regions for, uh, for timber. Um, because it was scarce, it was expensive, uh, it was needed for building ships for all of that maritime transport that I've already mentioned. Um, and the, the, the third constraint that I want to mention is that it's really a set of constraints that drought, famine, and disease were absolutely regular occurrences. Uh, and this was, um, these were facts of life uh, around which uh, these communities uh, organized themselves and figured out how not just to survive, but in fact to thrive. How did they do so? Uh, they uh, grew cereal uh, despite the challenging uh, dry conditions, uh, barley did better than wheat, but uh, wheat was extremely uh, plentiful in places like Egypt, Sicily, and peninsular Italy. Uh, olives grow everywhere. They are indigenous to the Mediterranean, and they were an absolutely crucial uh, 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 commodity for uh, fuel as a food source, as a medium for storage and preservation, and even for, uh, for, for medicine and skin care. Um, grapes uh, grow very well in this region, and uh, wine was widely traded. Um, this is also a, a region that survives fundamentally, really basically, on an agro-pastoralist system, so uh, a system in which agriculture and stock rearing uh, were complementary activities pursued in tandem with one another. And more generally, in, a, in approaching all of these strategies for, uh, uh, for economic survival and productivity, and against the constraints that I mentioned earlier, uh, the people of the ancient Mediterranean pursued sort of three basic strategies, which were to diversify, um, to store, and to redistribute. So to diversify crops, uh, diversify commodities as much as possible so that if one were subject uh, to a, uh, a disease or a, a failure of some sort, there would be uh, other, other crops to survive on. Uh, when they had uh, excess, when they had surplus, they stored it as well as they could. Um, and what they couldn't store or use right away, they redistributed through trade. And that takes us kind of full circle um, back to the, uh, the very regular maritime, uh, maritime trade and stopping uh, all, all along the coast. That was absolutely uh, a prominent feature of Mediterranean survival strategies within the environment in which they found themselves. So uh, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I wish you the best of luck uh, with your teaching this year uh, in this very, very unusual year.